I apologize um, for uh, my uh, departure there. The uh, technology got a little bit away from me. I appreciate the, uh, the pleasure to be here and appreciate the opportunity to talk about uh, compost dairy barns. Uh, these are a uh, new kind of alternative housing and uh, we should, uh, uh, this will be an opportunity for some of you that have not heard about these to, to learn about it and those of you that have, uh, maybe you can ask a few questions that will get other people uh, uh, aware of, of some of the issues you've seen as you work with them. Uh, they are relatively new. We've only had them in uh, Minnesota since 2001, so we've only got about six years of, of time with them. The bedding management is quite different. It's quite different than the uh, system that Sean was talking about, and it's very important on how that is, is, is managed. Uh, they're not for everyone. Uh, one of the key things is the producer being able to find a uh, reliable and economical source of fine, dry sawdust um, our information, we don't have a lot on this, is about uh, 26 cubic yards of fine saw, dry sawdust uh, per cow per year is, is what we've got going on here. And uh, the latest information from one of my colleagues in Extension, Wayne Chopper, is that it's about 65 cents per cow per day uh, for the sawdust bedding. So let's go through and uh, just give you a little bit of an introduction to them. As I mentioned before, again, uh, the first one built in Minnesota was in 2001. They are used to house uh, dry cow herds and uh, milking herds and special needs. Typical range that we see in up the Midwest is someplace between 40 to uh, 200 cows is what we have there. In many respects, uh, compost dairy barns are similar to naturally ventilated freestall barns, and so in some respects, when I talk about this, I'll be talking about how they are uh, like those, and, uh, but there are some differences. Uh, one of them, again, is we just simply replace the freestalls with the composting bedded pack. Uh, the sidewalls are generally taller for the uh, freestall barns. The, uh, there's concrete walls around them, like the uh, beef operations that Sean just talked about, and uh, the bedding management is quite a bit different on these. The information that we have on this is based primarily on what producers have, have told us from their, their field experience. So uh, many times I'll be talking to you and saying, well, the producers are telling us this. There are some research studies that have been uh, published there are some public uh, projects underway to get more information about how these uh, systems work. Uh, I will again address the, this website will be at the end of the presentation. This is our University of Minnesota Dairy Extension Team website. We've got newsletters, we've got presentations, we've got articles there. So if you want more information uh, about these uh, kinds of barns, it'll be there. So one of the things that the compost dairy barn producers are telling us is that they find these barns give excellent cow comfort. And uh, many of the producers also report that they have reduced somatic cell counts and increased milk production. Now some of that increased milk production and improved uh, reduced somatic cell counts is, is a combination from going from some poorer facilities uh, to these newer facilities. And so it's a combination of factors that are going on here, but you can do very, very well with them. Now, it's, I want to make it clear that uh, compost dryer barns are not like the conventional bedded pack barns that uh, have been used for a lot of different, for heifer raising and for other operations. Uh, those kinds of barns, the organic bedding accumulates. Uh, most of that bedding is, is anaerobic. And so that's something that we uh, don't want to have uh, going on in our compost berry barns. There was a study by Ward and others where they studied uh, these uh, conventional bedded packs, found the temperature and moisture and pH conditions are just ideal for pathogens to grow, and they have a reputation for promoting mastitis. And so this is a different kind of uh, housing operation. And for those of you that uh, wonder about the title of this, compost dairy barns, well, we're not bedding with compost. Uh, the, team, the, the, the name of them came from the producers telling us, well, we got this bedding and pack in here that's composting. And so that's where we got our name for it. My colleagues and I have uh, gotten together and, and tried to come up with six key points to, to the success of these. First one is, again, to provide 80 square feet per cow 
uh, or more of pack area for, for each uh, cow. This is for a 1,400 pound uh, typical Holstein. Uh, second one is use fine dry sawdust or wood shavings for bedding. This is uh, an area of, of a lot of interest to try to find alternative materials. There's uh, studies going on. We're working with producers that are trying different materials. Right now, we're still recommending that uh, we know the fine dry sawdust or wood shavings will, will work. The third thing uh, to make these barns a, a success is to aerate and stir the, that pack twice a day about 10 inches deep or deeper to keep it aerobic and fluffy. So again, compare this to a freestall barn. Uh, instead of scraping the alleys, now you go through and you stir the pack twice a day when you're milking the cows. Or if you milk them three times, you might do that uh, three times. Uh, the fourth success factor is to add bedding when it begins to stick to the cows. It's very, very important to not let that pack get too wet. And so the guideline that the producers are giving us is add it when it starts to stick to the cow. This also helps to keep the cows clean. To make these barns work, we need to have aerobic biological activity. We need to have ventilation. And so part of that stirring and aeration is to keep this biological activity uh, going and, and active. Next thing, last thing you need to do is use excellent pre-milking cow preparation. Again, for milk, high quality milk, you need to do this. Typical way of explaining a little again the differences between a, a compost barn and a freestyle barn might be to look at a barn like this, a typical three row barn. What you go in and, and what you change is you take out the freestalls, leave the feet out, leave the drive by manger, put uh, concrete walls around three sides and between the feed alley and the pack area, add in the composting pack area, add in waterers, have walkways, and provide, again, enough space for about 80 square feet per cow. And so this particular barn would handle about 100 cows. Now, if you compare that to a freestall barn, a three-row freestall barn is going to take about 62 square feet per cow. And a uh, two-row barn is going to have about 75 square feet. So we're going to take more space per cow in, in one of these kind of barns. Layouts. Uh, any kind of a layout works fine for a compost barn. We've got the drive-by, drive-through, and we've got people that have feed bunks. Composting bedded pack. This, is, again, is the key element to this operation. It's a bedded area. It's open. The cows can lay wherever they wish. We want to keep that pack, or we want to keep it biologically active all year round, cold weather, warm weather. And this uh, management of the aeration and moisture is very, very important. From a manure management perspective, this pack serves as a manure storage. And um, it's, uh, it's part of the manure storage process that uh, these producers work with. So they have to have solid handling uh, equipment to handle the pack, and then a slurry manure to take the scrapings from the feed alley. In Minnesota, uh, we, have, uh, we can build our composting bedded pack barns on just the native soil there that's packed. And uh, the logic is that the pack material will never get that wet that will leach any moisture out or drain any moisture out. And we don't put the waterers in the pack area so there's no water spills that are going to cause to, to leaching. Um, we also use four-foot sidewalls around there to provide that storage for it. Uh, the recommended pack area to size these barns for that is uh, 80 to 100 square feet per cow for these uh, large Holsteins, and for a Jersey cow, someplace in the range of about 65 square feet per cow. Now, we, we know these compost barns can work. Uh, they can work successfully. Now, why they work, we're not uh, completely sure, so this is a we're explaining is this sort of as a hypothesis. We're trying to do, get uh, funding to do research, and we're going to see if we can get a handle on this. But physically, what's happening when you stir that pack is you mix the manure and the urine that's on the surface into the pack, so it freshens that surface. It aerates the top uh, 6 to 12 inches, keeps it fluffy. We try, try to use the word fluffy. And that is going to help dry some of that urine and the moisture from the aerobic activity coming off of there. Biological processes, again, the aeration, the aerobic organisms are going to generate some heat. That's going to help us dry this. And we're going to dry some of that moisture off there. 
in the in the compost literature, we know that composting inactivates pathogens and viruses. Now we don't know that uh, what it does to the uh, disease organisms in uh, uh, in the compost dairy barns relative to, to mastitis organisms. Now the packed moisture is something that I worry a, a fair amount about, and again I've done some analysis that you know without evaporation six inches of this sawdust is going to get saturated in about seven days. And so we have producers that in this winter time they're, they're putting on bedding um, every week, two weeks, and uh, in the summertime they will go four to five weeks, uh, maybe even longer, uh, without putting any fresh bedding in there. They, they're able to keep it going. So if it gets packed, gets wet, it starts to compact, reduces the aeration, we slow the biological activity and we get this spiral of, of losing control of the, of the pack. So it's very important to manage the pack. How do they produce or how do they stir and aerate it? Well, we have people using a variety of equipment. Again, they do it at least twice a day. We try to encourage it to go as deep as they can. Uh, we want to avoid compaction. So we have one producer that is putting uh, tracks on his skid loader to, again, to minimize that compaction. We've got equipment on the back of the vehicle, in front of the vehicle, uh, rotary tillers, and uh, just see a lot of different things being used. We have some producers that in the last couple of years have started to use uh, deer, deep steering aeration uh, every other week or so, occasionally doing this to try to get more of the deeper pack to uh, keep biologically active and working on that. Whenever you're doing any of the stirring or aeration, it's important not to disturb the uh, packed earth below that. So again, it needs to be managed as, as that's being done. Okay, so let's talk a little bit again, just a bit more about this bedding management. When producers start with these, uh, we want them to start in warm weather or early fall to get the biological activity going. Start with 10 to 18 inches of, of the bedding. Um, Add bedding when it starts to stick to the cows. Some producers will add four to eight inches every two to five weeks. Others will add bedding every few days. Again, whenever it starts to stick on the cow, start adding some bedding. If a uh, problem uh, with your uh, supplier is a problem, you can lose control of your pack in, in a very few days um, and lose control with it. Some of the producers have had to learn how to handle semi-loads of bedding, so I'm going to put up storage to handle it, a uh, variety of things. We had uh, one producer that uh, tried cedar chips, got them at a good deal. The uh, pack went cold and got very, very wet. And we uh, believe that what happened there is their cedar has natural oils that are antimicrobial, and we think they decreased the microbial activity. He went back to uh, dry sawdust and uh, work came back and worked just fine. We take a look a little bit about, again, the layout of these uh, feed mangers. The design of them is basically the same as with a naturally ventilated freestall barn. Again, you can have different layouts, covered drive-by, uh, just a drive-by, a drive-through. All uh, work just fine. The feed alley where the cows stand is uh, typically, again, 12 feet wide, like the freestall barns. It's concrete, so it can be scraped twice a day. That uh, more slurry type of waste is stored uh, someplace in a temporary storage or long-term storage. We want this concrete to be sloped to drain any water away from the pack. Again, we're trying not to add uh, moisture to that. And then the wall there, is there separates the pack from it and allows that pack to get develop some depth uh, over the year. Walkways are where the cows and equipment go from the feed alley uh, into the pack area. That's how Stirring equipment gets into the area. Um, fresh bedding is brought up that way, 10 to 12 feet wide. And uh, when I usually have two per pen so that cows can have access. And then if you get a very large or long building, probably every 120 to 160 feet so they don't have to walk too far. Water options, the typical things is either by the feed platform, either on inside on the, where the cows stand or on the outside where the feed, main, feed is actually located or adjacent to the resting area is probably the most popular one. We do not place the waters in the pack area. We do not want to have any leaks uh, spilling water into the pack area. Uh, we want to keep the bedding out of the waters and also just to recognize you know, the pack depth is going to change over time. 
And so this is uh, the cow's uh, adjustment would not work well if it was in the uh, pack area. Ventilation is uh, an important element, as, as Sean talked about in his presentation. It's very important, again, for temperature control, but it's also, again, we're trying to get this moisture uh, out of the building. We, uh, we want to have a 10-foot uh, sidewall opening area, and so with a 4-foot concrete wall around the outside, our sidewall heights are taller than the typical freestall barn, so they're 14 to 16-foot uh, tall sidewalls. We want to have uh, eave overhangs uh, to again, prevent any rain from uh, being blown in onto the pack area. Many producers will put in some mixing fans to uh, help dry the pack surface and do some cow cooling. We see a variety of fan options. Uh, whatever the producer likes to work seems to work just fine with us. Some people are saying, well, can I do it post frame or hoop frame? We have uh, both kinds of options. We have a variety of hoops. We have a whole range of post frame type of compost freestyle barns, compost dairy barns. Manure handling uh, elements are, are important to everyone here that's listening today. Again, uh, this pack provides a, a storage. That storage is going to be a solid, so the producer will need to have a way of handling the solid bedding. They can use a smaller external manure storage for the scrapings from the feed alley. Some people are using mini pits inside, some are using outside, some are using a longer term storage and handling it that way. Um, our producers are estimating in some place between 25 to 35 percent of that manure is voided in that feed alley area. How much uh, material you'll get depends a little bit on how much gets dragged down from the pack area onto the pack also. So at the same time that they go in and uh, stir the uh, bedded pack, they will also change the, the equipment on the front of the skid steer loader and come through and scrape that alley twice a day with, uh, as, as they would in a freestall barn. Pack material is land applied in the fall and the spring typically. Um, usually the full clean out is in the fall after uh, silage is, is harvested. And we want to get that pack built up and started to go before in our upper Midwest cold climate areas that uh, we get that pack going before it gets really cold. And they need to follow their nutrient management plan on that. Here are some pictures that indicate the uh, mini storages. We have mini storages on the outside. That's the one on the uh, left side, uh, in the lower left. And then the picture of one on the inside. Uh, both, are, again, are out there being used. We have one producer that actually uh, uses a cross alley to provide some storage and does not have any outside storage for uh, uh, the uh, scrapings from the manure alley. There's not a lot of information about compost dairy barn nutrients. Uh, we've got the three studies that have provided some information on this that we've done here at the University of Minnesota. They've used different sampling techniques. They've used uh, collected data at different times. Uh, there's not a lot of barns that we've analyzed and sampled. The, the, the column on the right, the study by Russell, is, is still underway. They're still doing additional work on that. But you're seeing total nitrogen levels someplace between uh, 1 and 2.5%. Uh, the phosphate someplace between 0.28 and 0.36%. Uh, Potash, 0.7 to 0.84. Another area that, uh, or topic that some people are concerned about with, with relative to compost dairy barns is the uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio. We're putting a lot of bedding in there, a lot of carbon that's going in and being used as bedding. And uh, can that tie up the nitrogen when it gets land applied? That is part of the study that Russell is, is working on at this point in time. We have uh, two studies that have given some averages. Um, in the study that I led, uh, we had we were taking samples just as they were emptying the barns in the fall at some average levels. Uh, the Barberg study, they were sampling throughout the year, so they could sometimes get samples taken just after they'd added new uh, fresh bedding to that. And so that's why we just presented the quartiles there on that. So it's still a, a topic, but again, uh, Wayne Shopper has indicated that some fields have indicated some immobilized nitrogen for one to two months. 
Um, to maintain milk quality, again, the cows have access to uh, an organic bedding material. It's very important to have excellent cow preparation procedures to, uh, to keep that high milk quality. A couple of safety issues have been raised by uh, producers and uh, some researchers as we've gone through this. Again, we have dust from the, uh, the sawdust and sh uh, wood shavings. It will uh, vary from product to product. Some people uh, get uh, a larger size particle material. Some have very, very fine materials. So it does raise some questions relative to respiratory health and eye irritation for the employee or the person that's putting the material in and also for the cow. Usually within a day, uh, it's not a problem. It settles down quickly and starts to uh, pick up moisture and, and settle down. Uh, we've had producers mention that they have had to clean their air filters on the equipment if they've done a, um, put a lot of new bedding in when they start them in the fall, is kind of thing. And there's been some questions saying, well, what about the ammonia levels? And we're trying to get a handle on that information. So in summary, again, just some of the key points about compost dairy barns. They are different than the conventional bedded pack barns. They uh, have many elements that are similar to the naturally ventilated barns. But the bedding that we use is fine, dry uh, wood shavings and sawdust. We know that works. We are working with producers and trying to get a, some alternative materials that will work. The management of that bedding is very, very important. We need to stir it. We need to aerate it. Otherwise, it will be just a, a conventional pack. When it starts to stick, we need to add it. In the wintertime, you're going to be adding bedding uh, much more often. We need to get that heat from the compost action, the biological action, to help drive the moisture off there good cow prep, and then providing enough space. We do not want to crowd those animals uh, with it. Again, a lot of producers are looking for an alternative bedding material so they can get a reliable and economical thing. We'll, we're still struggling to get a good answer for that one. For those of you that want to have more information about it, uh, my colleagues and I have put a, a lot of our fact sheets and articles and newsletters on this uh, University of Minnesota Dairy Extension website. You can go there. Uh, Click on it, and you'll see a lot of different things. I want to thank everyone for your time and attention. And All right. Back thank to you, Kevin uh, Rick. and Sean. Appreciate those excellent presentations. Uh, we're going to have a discussion now. Uh, if you have questions, please pop those into the chat box.